Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is your educational engineer, Mr. Edwards here, and I just want to talk to you about these, there's a design process that engineers use, and there's eight main steps. Now, if you ask an engineer, they're not going to necessarily go through and tell you, well, I did step number one, two, then I did three. They're going to talk you through the whole process, but all engineers are doing this. This is kind of like a... Uh, um, the scientific method for engineers. There's, there's a process behind it. Okay, first of all, you got to understand there is a, a relationship between these three things. Um, so engineers need to know their science. Um, they need to apply it, know it. Um, they need to know their technology, whatever they're working with. I mean, it could be a new technology, and they have to be familiar with it. It could be a new software. It could be the technology for, you know, drilling underground. I mean, you know, the, the possibilities are, are basically limitless in this case. But they need to be familiar with that technology that they're going to use to solve the problem. Remember, engineers are problem solvers. So they need to use their science and knowledge of technology to solve whatever problem or meet a need. Okay, so this is a nice circular process and the reason why it's circular is because this is a process that could occur many times. Depends on what you're trying to design. If you're an engineer and you're going through this process and you don't quite meet the, the need or solve the problem the first time around, well, then you might have to do it again. Uh, then you might have to do this, the process again. And, I mean, this could be something that takes days. It could take weeks. Maybe this takes actual years. Uh, again, depends upon the complexity of the project. So the first thing that we need to do is identify the need of the problem. So, you know, are we trying to design a better shoe? Okay, are we trying to do something like the Quabbin Reservoir in Massachusetts where the problem was is that the Boston area needed more water. So we needed a supply of water and we needed to figure out, okay, well, where can we get that water? And that water comes from central Massachusetts and is delivered through these, these huge pipes all the way into the Boston area. So, you know, it, it could be something, the need or the problem could be something simple or it could be something really, really big and complicated. Okay, so you need to research the need of the problem. So, you know, if I'm trying to solve the problem of, well, I need to make a shoe that, or running shoe that uh, helps to solve plantar fasciitis, which is, uh, you know, a, a problem with the foot. Well, I need to know what the causes are of that. How, why do people have this in the first place? Then I need to research well, what is there out there, if anything, that is current solutions to that? Sometimes there's not a solution out there, and you're breaking you're breaking new ground on this. So you're coming up with the first you're you're attempting this to solve this this need or problem the first time. Then again, this could be something like, for example, the footwear, where all these different companies are out there. Everybody's trying to solve the problem. You want to do it better, okay? Because if you can actually create a product that meets that need or solves that problem and the people with the plantar fasciitis with their feet are using your product and, and you're getting positive results, well then your product is actually going to be um, you know, more desirable. You know, you're going to sell more shoes. You're going to make a better reputation for yourself. If you're the engineering company that's helping you to design that, well then their reputation is going to be increased and then that means that you can end up ultimately with more business because more people are going to want to hire you. Okay, develop possible solutions. How many? Depends on what's going on. Um, you could have one right away. There could be two. Maybe you have a team of engineers working on a problem and you've got 20 possibilities. Basically, this is the type of situation where when you're developing the possible solutions, you throw every idea out on the table. There are no dumb ideas. There, are no, there, there is really, at this stage, there's no possible... Brainstorming is all about just throwing out ideas, no matter how ridiculous they sound, no matter how far-fetched, because what it does is it gets those people that are doing the thinking, um, it gives them the ability to think about 
you know, well, how can we tweak this possible idea and make it work? Or, or, or you know, it's just, it just opens up numerous, numerous possibilities. Okay, so now if you have, in this case, like you've got a team of engineers coming together, this is, you know, you, you might have, you're probably going to have more than one idea. Okay, so you lay it out on the table and you say, okay, well, which one seems to be the best? And the best may not necessarily be the cheapest. It may not necessarily be the, uh, maybe the strongest design because the strongest design for your project could actually be more costly and maybe cost is a huge limiting factor for your, uh, for whomever you're designing it for, okay? Then you construct a prototype. So prototype, proto is just referring to the first. Um, so you, you come up with this brainstorming idea, you select it, you say, okay, well, we're going to try that. And you put your effort, time and effort into, and money, into designing whatever that prototype might be. So let's say these they look like students. Let's say these students are actually trying to design a bridge, like a real life bridge. Well, that might be their prototypes. Now, prototypes can actually, they can be a few different things as far as how they're built. Number one, if I'm building a, a bridge and I want to know whether or not that bridge is going to withstand a load or withstand, uh, you know, pressures or winds because of, uh, you know, maybe it's over a big, huge canyon and there's lots of winds, you know, or whatever it might be. Chances are I'm not going to be spending millions of dollars to build a bridge that may potentially fail and have to do that multiple times. So we use scaled down versions of that. So this could be a prototype, a scaled down version. I mean, this could be a 1 to 20 scale. I'm just taking a guess here. Okay. What engineers will often do is they will, now this is a pretty simple prototype. I don't know if they spend a lot of time choosing materials, but engineers that have a design are going to work with materials engineers, they're going to work with structural engineers, all types of different, you know, types of engineers, and they're going to choose the materials that best represent what the realistic bridge is going to look like. And then they'll test it. They'll test it for load, which is weight. They'll test it for those forces. You know, maybe they'll actually be testing it for, well, well, corrosion or what happens if oil from the cars get on the bridge. And whatever they, they might be looking at, they're going to test that. If it can work in that scaled-down version, then they're going to feel a lot more comfortable and actually build something that's a lot bigger, which is going to take more time and money, and they're going to um, do that. Or if it totally fails, so let's say this prototype, they test it, and the thing only holds you know, a little bit of weight and they scale up the weight to be like, well, you know what, that'll be able to hold little cars, but it won't be able to hold big trucks. Well, then they've got to scrap that idea, modify it, or go back to the, you know, the drawing board and, and pick another solution. So they can do scaled down versions. Sometimes you need to go the opposite way. So if you picture like, an, I'm going to just use iPhone as an example, or a cell phone, or some of the components maybe in a compu in, in a computer like a desktop uh, or not even a desktop like an iPad or a, or a laptop those components are very very small if you've ever opened one up it's tough to manipulate with your fingers it's tough to tell you know where pieces go okay yeah people are trained on it now but what happens when they were developing it so what they can do is they can take those very very small components and they can actually enlarge it so instead of scaling it down you're scaling it up so if you can picture parts of an iPhone being like, you know, five times bigger, so not the iPhone itself may be five times bigger, then human hands and people can actually physically interact with it. They're, every part is scaled, every part is designed, you know, set up so that it, it's supposed to be the way it is or the way it's going to be, potentially. And they work with it. Can this actually fit together? Are there any problems? Okay. Once they're comfortable with their huge version of this, they can then scale everything down. So what they made real big when they were working with the prototype can now be scaled down to the realistic solution to whatever that problem is. Okay. And that's how you can get things that are smaller. Okay. So test and evaluate the solutions. Now you've come up with, you know, this is our prototype. This is what our solution is. Well, you still have to go back and you have to test and evaluate. 
You know, you're, you're not going to just build something and then just throw it off to that use without giving it tests. So this could be, again, this could be something that takes, you know, it could be take hours if it's something simple. It could be taken days, weeks. Maybe it might even be something that actually takes years in certain complex situations. Like, you know, if you're looking at weathering, you know, on certain materials. There are ways to speed up that weathering process, but sometimes you have to slow down and say, look, here's our design. We're going to go throw it outside, you know, in the New England weather, and we're going to see what the, you know, what the change in season does to it. We're going to see what the, uh, what acid rain does to it, too. It all depends upon the time constraints, the money constraints, uh, and many other things. So you're always going to test it. Okay. And then once you're done, you're going to be communicating the solution. So engineers are constantly having to uh, effectively communicate. And, you know, if you're a company being hired, well, then you're going to go back and try to sell your solution to whomever hired you in the first place. Remember, engineers, they're selling their brain power. They're selling a service. So you're, you're hiring them per hour, plus the cost of their materials, whatever those might be, to be able to solve that problem. So... A huge chunk of money um, is going to be going into paying an engineer to come up with a solution to that problem. And that solution will then be something that you're going to go back, the engineer is going to go to the company or the person and say, okay, this is what we came up with. And if that person hiring the engineering company is not happy, there's a couple of things that can happen. Either they say, well, look, I'm, we're just not going to, we're not going to do business anymore. Or more than likely, they're going to say, well, I don't like the look of it. Could you do this to it? And they, and they tweak it. Okay. And then there's always the option to redesign. Okay. So you're not going to communicate, you know, the or you're not going to create the solution right away necessarily. It's going to happen maybe multiple times, uh, a couple times, maybe a couple hundred times. Again, depends on the complexity. Okay.